calling in virtual and they're right there. So Headlair and uh, Rob Lowe, and we have <laughs> Glenn, you can take a seat. Fred, we're waiting on you. <laughs> I had to transfer mine over. So, um, hello again, everyone. And uh, everyone here, I think, is from the last session. So, I'm not giving a full introduction about myself. Uh, but uh, for those who are online and calling in right now, I'm the senior operations research analyst uh, with AppWorks and uh, an SME uh, on unmanned systems for uh, Agility Prime and AppWorks. So, uh, with that, um, let me start out with a short uh, segment, you know, uh, information about air mobility and uh, why this panel is here today. So, uh, history of aviation, you know, extends for 2,000 years, and uh, from flying kites to supersonic, hypersonic, we have witnessed a lot. Uh, and uh, you can say, you know, with the Wright brothers' first flight, which was like what 12 seconds, but four years of research. Uh, that's the data I have. Four years of research, and then you have. Uh, you know, uh, Captain Lindbergh, uh, Lindbergh's flight uh, transatlantic, uh, which was uh, is one of the first flights uh, that showed uh, you know capability not just in the, uh, in the aviation but also helped build the aviation industry, where private investors started putting in money towards uh, what we call the aviation industry. So we have amazing history, and it's spanned over years, uh, and then now we are come to a point where. We're talking about advanced air mobility. And advanced air mobility is it's not something new, but it's just talking about new innovative ways of air transportation for both passengers, uh, that's people, and cargo. Uh, and the main thing there is quick, the quickness, uh, how fast it can be done, and how safe it can be done. So air mobility, uh, we are talking about eVTOLs, uh, and then there are other S. STOLs and then HSV tolls. A lot of types of, uh, 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 but all these stand for basically uh, vertical, like vertical takeoff and landing aircrafts. But the main thing here is uh, we are trying to focus on is um, the advanced air mobility in Texas, and this also can be for folks uh, in other states who are thinking about uh, you know integrating uh, AAM into their uh, airspace. So um, we have an esteemed panel, uh, both virtually and in person so uh you know we i will in, uh, do a quick introduction i let them talk more about what they do and everything but the i've put a title for everyone so i'm going by the order and uh, dr ted lair uh, i call him the architect uh, so he is the data uh, data architect at the center of excellence and innovation with the city of austin so dr lair um as uh, your virtual, and uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. Is that, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yep. So uh, the question I have for you is, uh, from a city perspective, what are the benefits for advanced air mobility? And do uh, give a little bit more information on uh, City of Austin and how you are involved in the AM space. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dash. The, uh, my, my role in the City of Austin is, is creating alliances, perhaps informal, formal alliances between the universities, the private sector, and the federal government. And first, I want to thank FWorks and Capital Factory for putting this on. The kinds of things we're, we're looking for benefits, we're, we have a, quite a bit of experience with uh, the smaller drone drones. We find that they uh, are safer. We do building inspections. They help us um, rescue folks who are distressed. For example, people who want to jump off buildings. We find that they help us be, get situational awareness for public safety. They allow us to do more um, and more precisely. Um, we can do uh, inspections of our watershed, of our power lines, of our infrastructure. We can assist our public safety folks in very interesting ways. But this conversation is about the, the sort of the, what we will call the people carrying uh, aspects. And we have a focus on the, the public safety piece. Um, there is a, the ability to, to, to be able to react faster, to, do, to be able to place a paramedic in, in a problematic situation better. These are the kinds of things we see as great benefits. Our public, we're, our public safety folks are excited about this opportunity. But also interestingly, not just in terms of serving our community, one of the things we are um, we find that our role as a city is 
is that we provide civilian use cases for these uh, these technologies that our national security organizations want to have for their national security uh, functions. Uh, the companies that make these these things need to have civilian marketplaces, civilian use cases, and the cities part of the cities by doing these kinds of things can provide those use cases in those markets for those companies. Thank, thank you, Dr. Lair. Uh, if I've not uh, forgot to mention uh, why I'm using names for specific people mm -hmm. is because this is the next movie for Marvel Comics. Uh, it's future of AM and we have names for each person and how they're going to make this successful. So uh, <laughs> the next person is uh, Mr. Glenn Hammer. He's the rainmaker. Uh, Glenn is the president and CEO of Texas Association of Business. So from a state perspective, the same question, how do you see the benefit of AM? Yeah, first I would say I'd be delighted to break into the Avengers <laughs> franchise. So I appreciate that. Uh, from, from the state perspective, this is certainly something we want to pursue. I mean, and, and I think it's important just to, you know, so the Texas Association of Business, we're in the State Chamber of Commerce. We work very closely with the 200 or so chambers from across the state to keep Texas as the most competitive state in the country to do business. I mean, if you really think about it, right here where we're seated, Texas is the center of the free market system in the free world, and central Texas is the center of the center. And one of the ways Texas will continue to stay in the pole position, we've won the Governor's Cup from site selection nine straight years, 17 straight years, CEO magazine, I could, I could exhaust all the time with all the awards, is through staying on top of where the hockey puck is going. And we look at this area as being one of those key areas that need to be developed. We'll talk about it, I think, a little bit later, but our job is to make sure public policy on the local, state, and the federal level uh, all work. And I want to you know, commend our friends from the city of Austin for what they've done here, and the state legislature passed an important bill, uh, SB 763, uh, in the regular session to create a task force to assess, to assess current state law and potential changes. And I know we'll soon have a speaker uh, from the FAA because that's going to be an important component as well. But we just appreciate what you're doing. And one of the, the my final point is that we're a great source of convening. And we were fortunate, thanks to uh, my friend and, uh, and someone who has been helping our chamber, Drew Chevrolet. We hosted a meeting of several months ago at the state chamber, about a half a mile from here, with a number of the interested partners. So this is something we plan to continue to uh, participate in and uh, appreciate the chance to be here this afternoon. Thank you. So next we have the next superhero is Lieutenant <laughs> Colonel Martin Salinas. Uh, in the DOD world, he goes by the name Riddler. So we couldn't yeah. use Riddler because DC Comics has, a, I think, a, a copyright on Riddler. So it's integrator. So from uh, so Riddler is the chief operations officer for AFWorks and the AFWorks Austin hub chief. So uh, from an Air Force perspective, why the interest for AAM? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we've, one of the big things we're obviously interested in is advancing that next market. You know, it, what is that next technology that we don't want to miss? You know, so back in 2006, you know, you had this uh, uh, Frank Wang started up a, a new company called DJI uh, with these DJI drones. I think if I would have taken that uh, DJI drone at that time and brought it to perhaps a uh, you know, someone within the military, maybe a decision maker, and said, "Hey, what is the uh, benefit here to military utility or our, uh, you know, commercial space?" Uh, you know, at that time, you know, I think the uh, iPhone was, uh, you know, iPhone one was about maybe recently coming out. Um, so a little bit ways back, uh, they probably wouldn't have seen the potential for that, right? So, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do as, as AFWorks, as you know, AFRL, uh, as the Air Force, uh, you know, DoD uh, innovation community, is look for that next technology. You know, today, China has 80% of the market in, in drone technology, right, with, uh, with those aircraft. Uh, we kind of missed the boat. So when we look at vertical takeoff and landing, eVTOL, you know, uh, any of these sort of technologies, advanced air mobility, um, you know, all, all of those sort of capabilities, we're just very interested in making sure that we allow, if you believe, you know, again, America should be leaders in technology, uh, and we, we hold that, that place uh, well then we don't want to miss that opportunity. So you know, we have a very big interest in pushing forward with that, not only for the capability 
uh, that it brings the nation uh, in our economic and, and business opportunities there, but also the, you know, there's great opportunity there for military utility, right? So from moving cargo to last mile logistics, to moving people uh, and that sort of thing, uh, there's so much opportunity there for so many different use cases. We'd really like to explore the space. Thank you. Next, we have Rob Lowe, uh, who's the gatekeeper. Uh, Rob Lowe is the regional administrator for Federal Aviation Administration Southwest region, uh, which includes states of Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and New Mexico. So the question comes to you is, uh, from a federal perspective, uh, are we ready for AM? Well, thanks, Dash, and good afternoon, everybody. And uh, my answer, Dash, really is yes and no. Uh, and the reason I say yes and no is because uh, that's intentful. Uh, we have approached uh, AAM along with other emerging technologies in a crawl, walk, run uh, progression. And that is what we are working for uh, towards for UTM and AAM specifically, you know, as those operational you know, procedures, technologies uh, evolve, is to be able to keep pace with that. So one of our goals internally is to have the airspace and our operational capability ready when those aircraft or those operators are ready. And that's a staged thing. So that requires us to stay abreast of where's the development at? Where is it coming from? Right now, we're uh, engaged with or at least communicating with the well over 200 companies across our country that are in the process of doing things in the AAM, uh, UTM type world. We do recognize, however, though, that Texas um, is certainly leading the charge uh, along with a couple other areas in this world in development. We are actively engaged in uh, places where we're testing and developing corridors and helping to facilitate technology uh, and those sort of things. So I think we are um, intentfully not at the full answer yet, uh, but, but we believe that we're on track and fully recognize that the eventual solution is not something we hold the answer to. Um, it is something that we will need to continue to collaborate and partner with, not just across the industry, but with state and, state and local levels. And everybody really is involved to make this work. When you think about how our national airspace system uh, operates today, uh, it's in a state of evolution. And it is at a state that, that I like to equate to, um, some like to point to, you know, where we, where we were at the start of the jet age, but I really think we're farther back. I think we're closer to when the Wright brothers first flew. Um, what it's going to be in a few years and down the road, the change from what we were to what we will become is as equal as the change of first flight. And I think we're, we're not only looking at technologies that we're talking in this panel, but commercial space and um, military fifth gen aircraft that we need to provide you know, venues where they can train like they're going to fight, right? So there's a whole evolution of an airspace that was designed historically to accommodate different type of operation. That integration is really where we're focused on as we move forward. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Adrian Doko. Uh, he's the educator. Uh, Adrian is the president of the Lone Star chapter of the Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. And he's also an FAA safety team, North Texas lead drone pro. So Adrian, um, from a public acceptance perception uh, point of view, is the public ready for AAM? Uh, I think the majority of the public, I mean, I grew up watching the Jetsons as a child and just having George Jetson throw his suitcase out on the street and, you know, a, a magically uh, a, a drone taxi would a, a appear or a vehicle, an air vehicle of some sort. So there's still a lot more wood to be chopped for us to get there. Uh, however, by building trust with the public through trustworthy systems, you know, we have the safety in place. And uh, I think the public has, you know, there, there's room to grow, but I believe the public is ready for advanced air mo and mobility to take off. Sure, thank you. So now we'll be getting into, uh, you know, questions that are related to city and state, military, FA, and we'll be getting into even the public acceptance side. So on a city uh, point of view, uh, Dr. Lair, um, at a city level, can you give us an example of how a technology was integrated but was a challenge from public acceptance uh, side? Well, let me let me give you what we what we're anticipating in our in our current drone program. These are just the small bird drones that we use for situational awareness for inspections, this kind of thing. And they have cameras on them. They have lidar on them. If the public sees such a thing in the air and knows it's 
a city or even doesn't suspect it's a city, the default assumption is they're being surveilled, that they're being watched. And this is something we're trying to get ahead of. Um, and there's not a clear case that they understand what we're doing, what kind of productive things we're doing with it. So there's an assumption we're surveilling somebody. Um, what we've done is not just with the public, we're beginning to do with the public, but we're bringing in some of our offices that normally don't engage with our transportation or public safety folks until something bad happens. You know, we have accidents, cities have accidents. And so what they're, uh, our, so we brought our civil rights officer in to watch our fire department and our EMS folks uh, do some work. We expect to have uh, them have conversations and, and, and with it. We have brought in um, some experts from UT who are very skeptical, skeptical it seems about our, what we're doing with our cameras on our drones and this kind of thing. We showed them the kinds of things the fire department does when it rescues somebody trying to jump, jump off a crane. Um, the kinds of things we're looking for, why we're zooming in on a person's face to see or why in the person's body, when we're doing it to see if there's weapons and that kind of thing. Or when we were fighting a fire, how can we tell where the fire is going from a drone? We can use thermal cameras. When we demonstrate the productive uses, of the, the, the life-saving or life enhancing uses of these technologies, not only to the public, but also to the offices that are often tasked with sort of investigating or critiquing some of our, our, our departments that use these things, I think we're gonna end up with a better situation. I think we're gonna be the first city, um, at least that's what the drone people tell me, who will have a drone policy program. We're gonna be setting up, this is just as anticipating, you know, the, the, the larger drones, the people carrying drones. So the, it's more of a uh, reacting to that kind of thing. We and, and also engaging the community early. And I think it was Dash who said in the last panel that we need to educate or we want to educate the public. If we tell that to our our, pub, our engagement folks, they say, no, 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 no. The public needs to educate us. Now, that may sound a little flip, but what they mean by that is what is the public concerned about and what are the ways we should talk to them? So there's a lot of education that comes from us to the public, but the public has to tell us what they're afraid of. And so we respond in kind to show them that there's a lot of wonderful things we're doing. And we ask, we listen to them and say, well, what do we have to do to make these, these drones acceptable to the community? Not sure that's a direct answer to the question, but that's the kind of way we're thinking about uh, engaging the community. Sure, that makes sense. And uh, uh, you know, when it comes to any new technologies, we also have to understand uh, the uh, future. Uh, you know, in the focus of workforce development, economic development for the state. So, um, Glenn, uh, on the side of public-private partnership, can you give an example of uh, a uh, initiative which helped? Uh, both from an economic and a workforce development because we could take lessons on the AM perspective. Yeah, I mean, the, the way I'm going to answer that, there's been some very good collaborations over the years in, in Texas uh, when it comes to funding cancer research. And there's an effort right now as we speak to put something together on semiconductors with all the challenges. And I, and I believe that that also connects to the topic at hand here. But we look at this opportunity as a model and, and you think about the ingredients, Dash, and the people who are part of this panel, City of Austin, the FAA, uh, the military, uh, we have a great university system in the state of Texas, a great community college system, and you have virtually every chamber in the state engaged on workforce development, which includes making sure that the homegrown talent, and that's important, this is the stickiest state in the union, people don't leave here uh, for good reason, that they have the skills that they need to get into these modern areas. So, you know, one of the things, as I mentioned, the legislation that the Texas legislature passed a, a few months ago, uh, you know, our department, is, the Texas Department of Transportation is taking the lead there. And the good news is that because the state is doing so well uh, financially, uh, there's perhaps some more resources available than uh, would, would would otherwise be be the case. But the the thing we want to do, Dash, is to again is to convene. And uh, you know, it's always great to be at the Capitol Factory. So this is impossible to beat as a great uh, venue. But but we also welcome people to the Texas Association of Business, where we could we have a nice view of the state capitol and. We often bring uh, leaders such as the people in this room together. My final point is in terms of workforce. There's another great 
uh, fact that I think is important. People are moving to the state. They want to move to the state. That's always a good thing. We have 30 million people. We're the fastest. We're the only state in the country that picked up two congressional seats. And I'm predicting in the lifetime, maybe not of mine, but of many of the people who are in this room, Texas will probably be the most populous state in the country. So this is a great place to tackle the, the industries of tomorrow. Oh, that's, that's a great point. And I'll be coming back to a uh, question on the funding uh, part of it. But um, from a military perspective, Riddler, um, I, I know that AFWX uh, wants to operationalize EVTOLs by 2023. Mm -hmm. What challenges are you facing? And uh, how do you see uh, everyone here could help out with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, when I think about the operationalization, and we talked about this a little earlier with a couple of other panels. I think Jason Ratchie even brought this up about, you know, what is dual use, you know, because when we're investing, you know, we do things a little bit differently. We're, we don't necessarily come out with a specific requirement and then uh, seek a solution. Uh, you know, again, we're looking for those, those uh, uprising technologies. Um, we also do value dual use. And as Jason mentioned earlier, um, you know, that's not a product, that's a market, right? So we have to look at those two markets. And one of the things we're sensitive to uh, is we don't look at that product uh, that is being prepared primarily for the commercial market and want to make it into, uh, you know, to kick it off its, its path into a Frankenstein product that's more specifically tailored to our use case. So obviously that's very challenging. So you have these two very unique markets that have to be met sort of simultaneously within also two different funding uh, timelines, right? So, uh, you know, you've you heard folks talk about the fact that, you know, the commercialization side has to be thinking about the venture capital that flows in, uh, the private uh, capital that's invested. Uh, on our side, it, it's a little bit different. You know, so we, we have to look at, you know, not only colors of money. So for one example, silver bitter dollars are uncolored, right, that we can use them for any kind of spending. But at some point, we have to get a very specific line of funding to that product in order to, you know, make it a program of record, operationalize it, and put it in a, a warfighter's hands. So those are two distinct, um, you know, pathways that have to work parallel. Um, you know, on for example, with EV tolls and urban air mobility, um, you know, one of the things that's a challenge, and I just had an earlier meeting today with a startup company, is, you know, the two different regulatory environments, too, right? To get this, uh, you know, EV tall flying in a city, that's one regulatory environment. To get it flying on a base, well, that's relatively open. We take on that risk and that regulation. So uh, all of those different, um, you know, pathways ahead, uh, leading in different directions that require different kinds of funding and attention uh, are always a challenge. It's something that we're we're sensitive to, right? And, and the other part of that is, um, you know, each market has a difference in acceptance, right? So the commercial market, the, you know, everyday uh, citizens have to have the trust in the technology and they have to want to adopt it. There's a regulatory environment that has to be safe, as you mentioned. Uh, from the military environment, they have to see utility in that product that's compelling enough. Uh, and, and what they're used to is a product that is almost 100% of what they need, right? Versus today, if we're going to rapidly uh, you know, operationalize these, we may have to look at something maybe a little bit different because it's not going to be that product that's completely ready for the commercial market. Maybe it has to be at the 80% level and then we do some developmental operations after that. So uh, a lot of things to consider there. Cool. And that and that really brings up to the question on uh, from operationalizing, uh, you know, the airspace part of it, airspace integration. So, uh, Rob, uh, from an FAA perspective, what do you see is a challenge when it comes to integrating EV tolls into the airspace. It's already so busy. Uh, you know, what uh, is your concern and what is the FAA doing uh, to educate or overcome these challenges? Well, thanks, Dash. Yeah, there's certainly a number of hurdles that we see now and we recognize that there's others coming that we don't see yet. And we want to be sure that we're not um, narrowing our view or uh, putting blinders on uh, and putting the emerging technologies into a, uh, a preconceived bucket, right? So I really appreciated the way that Riddler said that a minute ago about you know the way they're approaching funding those emerging technologies without defining the solution. We're trying not to limit what we see uh, in the same way, but existing today, um, we have we have challenges. So a lot of the the uh, crawl, walk, run strategy I talked about, we see initial development having a manned pilot uh, or a a piloted craft 
be some of the initial steps that eventually may just be carrying passengers or cargo or something like that. But that that evolution as it moves forward is really part of part of that strategy. Um, adapting how we keep vehicles separated from each other is a challenge that we see. And I'll give you an example. Recently, uh, one of the developers of aircraft in this um, venue uh, just went through the certification process. And at the end, I think most of us that sit on the outside of that process watching it happen expected that vehicle to be categorized similar to a helicopter, and it ended up being certificated as a fixed wing aircraft, primarily due to the lack of its ability to auto rotate and land. So what that does for us is that changes our ability to separate that aircraft over populated areas where a helicopter can fly over populated area at 500 feet, a fixed wing aircraft is limited to a thousand. So now that put that AAM vehicle in a different place for us, right? So um, those are the kinds of challenges that we need to look at the regulatory side. Does that need to adapt? Does it need to change? Um, are those existing requirements for emergency situations like an auto rotation still relevant to today? Another example is um, we've been working in North Texas for quite a while with the former Uber, Elevate, and now Joby and others, um, with potential uh, taxi-type operations into major airports, in this case, DFW, as a potential prototype. Um, and I think most people on here are familiar with the, uh, the configuration at DFW, north-south runways, very closely spaced. And this is not necessarily an airspace separation issue, but as we move aircraft in and out of what would be the terminal area, pretty much the only available way to do that is between those north-south groups of runways. DFW sort of has an east and a west airport, if you will, uh, and we go up and down what we call Spine Road or where the terminals are uh, to enter that airspace. Well, the volume of aircraft that are potentially being discussed in this type of operation, um, 120 to 140 operations an hour, in addition to where we're running 110 to 120 uh, arrivals in excess of 100 departures. So we're adding another third again into that airspace. One of the challenges we see today is the traffic collision and avoidance system or TCAS system that's in the piloted aircraft. The algorithms it uses, it sees these vehicles down low, generates a reaction that either is a, an alert or a, an advisory, a resolution advisory that the cockpit crew has to react to that would cause them to go around. So if we have a significant volume of these aircraft down there and a lot of our traditional, let's say, airliner type aircraft are going around, we lose uh, incredible efficiency, but let alone the impact to the operators and the customers in the backs there. So there's a lot of hurdles uh, technologically to get that there that we are working on to be able to do that. And those are just a couple quick examples of the types of things that we are trying to keep our eye on uh, as we integrate these operations in. But like I said earlier, we really want to adapt and have the airspace ready um, for when those various operations are ready to go and where we can do it. And developing corridors and those kind of things are ways that we can test that. Thank you, Rob. And I think that uh, you know brings us to the, uh, an important question, and which is to Adrian, is uh, what at a state and local level is being done to educate people about these challenges, about uh, you know everything about AM. And uh, you know how is your organization being involved in that, and how does startups, investors, you know, industry work in that uh, space? Uh, because I, I, you know, with other technologies, I've seen that sometimes uh, there isn't enough education coming from the technology provider, but it's more from everyone else. So, are you seeing limitation? Uh, you know, are you seeing issues with industry not being involved enough? So a lot of questions. Yeah, that, that's a loaded question there, but great question nonetheless. So AUV aside, the Lone Star chapter in particular, we've been very fortunate. Like the gentleman stated, we, we're in Texas. There's plenty of industry, plenty of involvement. We're uniquely positioned as a nonprofit organization to educate, advocate, and connect people with these emerging technologies. So we partnered with the North Central Texas Council of Governments, for example, uh, NASA as well to uh, tackle and create these workshops or, or task force to deal with these uh, issues. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, we, we really have to collaborate and come together and partner with uh, people that aren't aware with, uh, of the capabilities of these technologies. Uh, so it's been a, a struggle at times. However, we've been making a, a lot of progress uh, because we fortunate to have all these you know, Bell Textrons and, and Lyft aircrafts and all these different conglomerates in the space. 
Uh, and Bell, for example, has the, uh, we mentor a couple of high school teams that uh, has a vertical robotics competition. So at the high school level, kids are getting, you know, involved and, and understanding the, uh, the capabilities and the advancement, advancements in these technologies. So there's plenty of work that we have to do, uh, but outreach is definitely on the top of the list. We have to reach out to anyone that's willing to listen and advocate and educate people for these technologies. Sure, and uh, you mentioned about schools and stuff, so that, that really brings to the point about, uh, you know, we talked about funding, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, integration, the challenges, but when it comes to uh, workforce development, there's an important part is the STEM side of it. Like any new technologies needs to have a long-term vision. And when you educate kids uh, at a young age about these technologies, uh, they will be the uh, you know the end users who really benefit from what uh, is being integrated right now. So uh, this question could be to both uh, uh, you know Rob and to Adrian. Like on the STEM side, you mentioned what uh, Adrian you just mentioned about the schools that you're working with. But at a federal perspective, uh, what is being done uh, on the STEM side with these technologies? So Dash, uh, great question. Uh, one of the things that uh, that we are really focused on at the FAA is my my particular segment of the FAA. Our parent company houses all our parent company parent organization houses all of the STEM outreach for the FAA. Um, we throw another acronym on the back end of that: Aviation and Space Education, or AVSED. So STEM AVSED is a noun for us. Like like most of us live in worlds where where acronyms become nouns. And for us, um, we've really evolved over the last few years, especially in how we look at that in in a couple really important ways. Um, one is historically our STEM outreach had always been targeted at like high school and college level. Um, looking for selfishly to try and attract employees to the federal government, if not just to the FAA down the road. What's really exciting about where we've pivoted in my mind is the FAA has totally changed that perspective in a couple, couple thoughts. One is uh, based on some science that talking to adults and some pretty extensive surveys to adults, that if you talk to them about what are you passionate about, not necessarily where you work, um, but what are you truly passionate about? That spark for that passion is often traced back to eight to 10 years old. And so that's where we're beginning to target STEM and AVSET outreach is to third, fourth, fifth, even sixth graders instead of high schoolers or in addition to high schoolers. Um, and the other cool thing that I really like where the, AV, where the FAA has pivoted is in lieu of trying to find future FAA employees, our goal is to create a spark for the aviation industry or the, even the space industry anything connected with the industry. And if they end up being an FAA employee, that's just purely icing on the cake. But if we can create that spark at an early age and also an awareness that it's not just the movie poster type jobs that are in the industry, it's not just the pilot or the astronaut or um, even the engineer, you know, it's, it's folks that love spreadsheets and it's folks that do uh, manufacturing. And I really like the way Glenn said earlier, talked about workforce development. That's really what it's about. It's, it's about finding, um, Dash, you said those end users, but also that workforce of the future. And how do we create that spark and help facilitate that as they grow up out of those uh, primary years into those mid school years and into high school? And how do we continue to feed them into programs? Like Adrian talked about the Bell program. We're excited to watch that and, um, and you know, support that as well. There are all kinds of ways that we do that. We pilot um, an area in my group specifically in the last two years, we call it adopt a school. Uh, we partnered in our case with the Dallas Independent School District. We were in five different elementary schools right as the pandemic started and continued for the rest of that school year, had to transition into virtually, but all things aviation um, are focused in there with that idea of trying to, to capture them early. And that has now become a national program that all of my peers across the country now uh, have an obligation uh, to create and reach out to schools. We're doing it now um, this year, uh, in addition to Dallas Independent School District, we're working with in Oklahoma with the Atoka Oklahoma School District, which is part of the embedded inside the Choctaw Nation, which most of you may be familiar with. Uh, the Choctaw Nation was initially one of our test sites for our IPP program and is now part of our Beyond program. The Atoka School District is closely connected to them, and we're now working in those grade school classrooms with the same type of program. So those are just examples of where we're trying to reach out and help create that uh, workforce of the future. Well, that's that's great, and uh, it's very important at a start at a very young level. Uh, hey, Dash. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just uh, I have to leave in about four minutes. I'd like to follow up on on Rob's work if, that, if you got it. So, in, in to show there's like a local case of what Rob was talking about, the city of Austin connected Del Valley ISD with the University of Texas with the idea of of having a career path or an education path for AI and drone technologies, where uh, the Del Valley ISD will produce folks who want to become engineers, either as bachelors, masters, or PhDs at UT. They want to create uh, uh, folks who are ready for jobs where they're operating drones, installing infrastructure for operating these systems, um, driving them, repairing them, that kind of thing. So locally, the idea, and we want to create this. We see that this is a workforce development opportunity. We bring local companies into these school districts and talking with UT and say, Talk with these these uh, institutions to help them um, educate folks, these these young people and their parents, by the way, on the on the careers going forward. And we're going back to some of the things we said earlier about how you engage the community. You provide a great education. You provide opportunity. You let your, the parents of these kids know that you're providing education that gives them great jobs in the future. The parents will start buying into some of the some of the technologies we want to be able to deploy in our communities. The last thing I want to say, just to make a point here with uh, FWorks, you were talking about some, um, some, some processes we have to fix, is that cities have a hard time buying from new small companies. The processes are just not built for that. They're built for buying from big companies, IBMs and Microsoft and Googles. But if a small, if, if a small company is validated or somehow is working with a federal agency, that makes it a lot easier for us and for a city to say, yes, this is something that we can trust. This is something that's been validated. So one of the things we want to work on, I think, is as a community is have the, the that national, the federal government and cities come out and validate these companies, validate these technologies and make it easier for the cities to adopt them. Because cities usually don't have processes that um, allow a small company to actually buy, you know, have anything bought from them in any, any reasonable time. I need to go uh, drop off and go to another meeting. I want to thank everybody for this opportunity and uh, you know, FWorks and Capital Factory. Thank you very much, but I, I need, to, need to drop off. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lair. So Dr. Lair brought a good point about uh, the trust thing. And this is what I've been mentioning earlier session also is, is that uh, we need to create a strong trust program where small businesses get an opportunity uh, to shine. Uh, this is either through universities, DOD, uh, or through various initiatives. But, uh, you know, for the trust also an important thing is, is where is the funding also coming from? Uh, we know today we learned a lot about the DOD side of the funding. So the question to uh, Glenn would be is, what uh, funding uh, pipeline does the state have, uh, which could be focused on AM or any other technologies uh, in the aerial space uh, that you know, a company should be aware about, uh, or is it's about to be created? Well, there's a few ways I would answer that question. There's uh, the state, uh, at least for the next several years, has a variety of tools, uh, economic development tools uh, that are available that are basically public-private partnerships, things like Chapter uh, 313, 312, uh, uh, and other, other types of tools for companies that are looking to get into uh, these spaces of innovation. And generally, Dash, the way it works in Texas, different in different states, is that the local communities, the, the school boards, the local economic development agencies uh, work with, with these companies. So uh, that's, that's one answer. The, the other answer I would say is that you know, the Texas legislature meets regularly every other year, develops a biennial, biennial budget, and uh, that's always an opportunity to look at more specific type initiatives, whether it's funding for universities or community colleges on the workforce issues that we've discussed or uh, other, other special uh, initiatives. But there are some good tools available right now that chambers and economic development agencies can help interested companies in this space uh, work on. Okay, so so that also makes us uh, aware that uh, DOD is not the only way of funding. Uh, we, uh, you can partner with states. I'm also aware that uh, Department of Transportation have funding mechanisms for universities uh, for small, but they are small amounts, but it helps start the process. So uh, we have the, uh, you know, the discussion about funding. 
uh, I'll uh, go back a uh, little bit to the aircraft as such. You know, uh, Riddler, uh, this question is to you. Like we already discussed about the funding mechanism from the DOD perspective, uh, but what is the aircraft certification? Uh, uh, you know, uh, focus that uh, DOD has been doing with eVTOL companies uh, that you know people should be aware about and. Could uh, this question will also go to FA after that in, on the certification side? Uh, you know, from uh, from our perspective, uh, you know, there's obviously different kinds of certifications that we have, uh, all to a, a path that you know, ideally is, is within the scope of, of what that aircraft is, you know, looking to accomplish, right? So, um, you know, uh, for us, it's it, it's going to drive our ability to test and and use that that aircraft. So. Uh, unmanned certifications, manned certifications, all allow us to get after uh, different approaches. So, you know, we, we had some aircraft in the portfolio that are seeking um, specifically, you know, just, just unmanned uh, or manned. Uh, what that allows us to do is, is get after it on our own uh, ability to test it, uh, test it in, in that environment, uh, sponsor it within uh, the kind of the, the tick marks of progression that we have to get through. Uh, and then also, you know, make an assessment for the, the progression of the technology and how it's developing, right? So it also sends, it sends a big signal, you know? So every time uh, we see that one of those aircraft have made it through uh, one of our certification processes, it has been a huge success story. It typically gets uh, a lot of attention uh, from the commercial space and uh, is typically a good measure of uh, that company's ability to progress that technology. That's, that's good. And, uh... Uh, on the uh, federal perspective, when it comes to aircraft certification with EV tolls, if you're looking at here, uh, there's uh, been a, uh, a wait on when FA is going to, uh, you know, uh, create the certification program that uh, other companies can, uh, you know, use. So, is there a delay on it? Why there is a delay, or how's how's the industry helping to get that certification in place? Well, Dash, I think uh, I wouldn't call it a delay. I'd, I'd call it uh, we, we are on track. And, and really, um, Riddler described a process that is very similar to ours on the federal side. We are very focused on uh, with anything certification associated with the UTM, AAM um, operations. Safety is clearly the, the op obvious thing that we're focused on. So the vehicle being able to, in the case of vehicles, being able to operate within the national airspace system safely uh, and from that is not just for the folks, if there are humans uh, in that uh, aircraft, but it's also what does the aircraft do to other vehicles that are, are operating in the national airspace system or the places on within our country that it's overflying, right? Is it uh, is it safe to overfly populated areas? Does it need to be rooted around it? Those kind of things. So you're looking at airworthiness type certification. Um, obviously, these vehicles are not similar uh, in a large spot to the materials. Uh, and the composition of how they're constructed to traditional piloted aircraft. So some of that is known, some of that is ongoing. And that's why I said, we don't look at it as a delay, but like I said earlier, we're working with well over 200 countries of uh, companies across the country that are all approaching their particular vehicle and their business model in a different way. And what we're intentfully trying not to do is put out a certification standard out there that predetermines what the solution is that would drive the market into a, a narrow, confined state that would actually inhibit the innovation and the creativity. So we want to progress our certification standards and our regulatory side along with the development of the technology as it emerges. Uh, and we can't, again, like I said earlier, we, we recognize we can't do that from sitting on the balcony and looking in and deciding we have the answers. That's very much, from our view, a collaborative effort that is across government agencies. We're partnered with NASA uh, and many other government agencies in a lot of work groups and those sorts of things. We are partnered across specifically within the Department of Transportation, across various agencies, but specifically within the ATO. And then even within the FAA, we have uh, our air traffic organization, which uh, is not just the air traffic control controller, you know, technician piece. It's, it's bigger than that, but it's all of our operational. Even within that, there's a strategy office that is very focused on what is the future of new technologies and specifically AAM look like. Uh, so all of that plays into our certification uh, piece that falls into our flight standards or AVS world as they work with the operators and developers going forward. So again, I think it's a, a piece that is on track. It's developing, um, but there's a lot of, um, 
I think Adrian may have said it earlier, a lot of wood to be chopped. You know, I love that phrase. So there's, there's a lot of room to go as we move forward. Sure. And, and, and totally understandable. Um, Adrian, from a perspective, uh, you know, this, since we have a lot of uh, folks who are in, from the industry, investors and academia, what's your message to them on how to be involved in the AM space? Are you talking about the industrial side or just the industry and the investors? How do they get be a part of the, uh, you know, like your organization or the state? Uh, what what uh, is their role and how should they be? What should they be actually focusing on? Yeah, I mean, just collaborating and, and involving all different aspects of the industry, working together and having transparency. Uh, you know, uh, it's unfortunate that a lot of these companies really don't communicate with other companies, but there's synergies there. If you have something that works uh, all across the board, you can collaborate with different companies uh, and, and work together to push the initiative forward. Advanced air mobility uh, is going to be a thing if we get together and, and really focus on the benefits. Uh, a few people mentioned when you pull at those heartstrings, these technologies can really save lives and make you know mankind a better place. So if we focus on that messaging, I think we'll be in a better place a couple of years from now. Sure. So as we are coming close to the end, uh, I would like to each of you all to define what is innovation according to you all. So let's start with Riddler now. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a yeah, that's a great question, and uh, you know it's it's almost relatively subjective uh, if we look at what innovation could be. And, and I, it's funny as as I've been in this uh, community of innovation, I've heard it described uh, in many different ways. Um, you know the, what it, the way it occurs to me is um, you know innovation. You know there's a, there's uh, not only a, a, a newness to uh, what occurs, uh, what, what, what product is developed from, from innovation, there's also uh, an aspect of time, right? So, um, you know, if it takes me 10 years to come up with a, a new technology, um, maybe, that's, maybe that's innovation. But I think now when we think of innovation, especially from a DOD perspective, um, there is a time factor, right? So we look at it... Uh, especially from a, not only making, you know, there, there's, again, going back to different parts of it, we look at innovation and how it can make airmen and guardians' lives better, soldiers' lives better, uh, things like that, solving real problems and, a, and, a, and the speed of relevance uh, to, to those uh, folks, finding it could be, you know, innovation could be a process, right? It doesn't have to be an actual material solution. And I would say a, a lot of times the best thing to do is start with processes. You know, how can we do something better? And if we can't get there uh, with a process, then maybe we look at, you know, so this innovative new way of doing something, and then maybe we look at uh, a way to tackle it with technology, and then perhaps both. Uh, you know, from uh, from an external to looking inside, if we look outside, um, you know, we've even seen it as innovative ways uh, to acquire things, to work with industry, uh, to partner, to find ways to go faster, um, to challenge our or I'm not even gonna say near peer, I'm gonna say peer adversaries or peer competitors out there in the, in the real world. So uh, again, I, I would say it's uh, you know, bringing in things that obviously are making our lives better within uh, you know, that, that speed of relevance. Totally makes sense. And Glenn, same question to you. Well, I, th I think practically, and we heard a good uh, definition and uh, philosophical discussion as well as the applicability and the relevancy and relevancy is an important word on the military side. So on the civilian side, it, I, I wish I could creatively think at this point of a, uh, as running a chamber of a, of a good business applic application. But I think this is an area where, you know, when, as the rules of the roads get established, if I were going to think right around the time we're at now, it's where using you know urban air mobility, uh, you could order barbecue and a beer, and the barbecue is warm and the beer doesn't spill, and it gets safely transported to wherever you may be. And and I think those are the types of things that that actually can happen uh, over time. But I think everything that we do, it has to be. It's important to break it down to practical applications that improve the lives of citizens and businesses. True. Uh, Rob, what's your definition uh, for innovation? 
Well, Dash, I think uh, for us, uh, innovation really uh, it starts with culture. I talked about some of the pivoting within the FAA around STEM outreach. A lot of that is happening across our organization, changing the way that we've looked at the service we provide to the people of the United States and, and looking at um, the, the culture really is the heart of innovation and, and what is your outlook and expectation. We recognize that if we keep doing everything the same way, we're going to get the same results, right? So um, we also, you know, intentfully recognize that innovation is not going to happen purely within the FAA. In today's world, emerging technologies like advanced air mobility are going to require our true collaboration. And for us, collaboration is you know, ensuring that all impacted stakeholders are in the conversation. Um, I, I, I think Adrian mentioned earlier, transparent conversation with what, what's your true desire, what's your need, what's your capability, um, how do we move forward? And then from the government side, being able to be truthful and transparent on what our limitations are and what, what restrictions are there and what would be the timeline to Riddler's point, what is the timeline that we can realistically change that regulatory hurdle that might be there? So I think that's really what the sorts of things that we think about when we think about innovation. And um, to, to Glenn's point, you know, I think about a test that's about to kick off in North Texas in the Frisco area um, with a food truck park and a defined small mile radius around it where a unpiloted vehicle will deliver barbecue and beer to houses within a <laughs> mile radius and you order it on an app and it shows up at a common landing zone in your neighborhood, um, that's that's on the doorstep today. So, you know, those technologies proven in those confined environments will eventually feed um, the bigger advanced air mobility world. Thank you, Rob. Adrian? Yeah, I think everyone touched on it. Uh, you know, the innovation is really when you provide those solutions, end-to-end uh, -end solutions for variable problems that we're having, you know, on our day-to-day -day life. So, Solutions, solutions, solutions. That, that's the key to innovation. That's true. And so we got a, a definition of innovation from the military, federal, state, uh, even from public uh, perception side, everything. And uh, as I wrap up this session, you know, uh, my point of view with, uh, you know, innovation is uh, everything they just said, but also to the point that um, we should be ready to fail. We should accept that failure is good in certain times. Uh, failing in a safe environment is important. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we're not going to innovate. Uh, but also important is when it comes to technology is to adapt and adopt the technologies. Mm -hmm. It it has to work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, today we got a perspective about AAM, but this could be easily, uh, you know, focused on any other technology. Uh, today we talked about Texas, but we could talk about any other state. So it, it does not have boundaries uh, and it shouldn't have limitations. Uh, and we are here to you know, address the challenges. Uh, we have heard a lot of challenges. These are just challenges that uh, are, uh, you know, we are able to fix at this point. But then there are other challenges that we still have to uh, find out. And that's where uh, working with small businesses and uh, you know, academia, we are learning some of the challenges that we were never aware about. And uh, all together, we have to work as a team. And when we are approaching, uh, I would feel, you know, like when we are approaching uh, from a state uh, to FAA, uh, and we are saying that we would like to uh, operate such aircrafts in the airspace, we have to uh, speak in one voice as a one team. So I feel, uh, you know, it's very important for all of us to come together uh, there are a lot of organizations working and they're doing an amazing job, but the important thing is to connect everyone together uh, for to witness AM industry sooner. Uh, and today we also learned about uh, timelines like 2023 operationalizing eVTOL from a military perspective for dual use, but that also comes to the point by 2025, we would like to see it more commercially available. So altogether, um, you know, a lot uh, was discussed today. But it leaves us with one important thing is, uh, as a company, as an investor, are we doing enough? Uh, and if we are not, then it's time to step up and understand these challenges and work uh, to fix this together. So um, we have a minute and, uh, you know, I'll let... Uh, yeah, yeah. No. Well, hey, if there's any questions online, make sure you throw, throw them in the chat. You have one right here. Perfect. Yeah. It's like I told... told. <laughs> so my question is... Uh, to one is between the cities 
suburbs and rural where do you think the market is for this technology the second quest the second question the second part of the question is between the different industries where do you think uh, who would be the early adopters of this technology anyone wants to take that question it, it also, i think it, part of it is and i hate to say that you know it depends right it depends on which if you're talking about just air advanced air mobility uh, in general it's probably a city right um from the actual product itself, uh, it, it may be the military, right? And, and not in the same way it's used uh, for advanced or mobility, uh, but it may be used to uh, carry uh, security forces, soldiers, or whatever out to an, uh, a, a missile silo, uh, you know, within the safe confines of a base or point-to-point -point, uh, logistics within uh, our, our space. So, and I think we're seeing, uh, maybe even used just for test, test and evaluation as, a, as an instrument, right, uh, of test, to test out different technologies. So uh, you may see it that way. I think the important thing, and I really appreciate uh, the comments uh, from our friend from the FAA, is that if the, the, the right rules of the air road are established, uh, the the markets and the companies and the innovators and the consumers will will fill in those blanks because their imagination uh, will rival anything even our friends in Hollywood can think of. And earlier it was urban air mobility and then it became advanced air mobility because we don't want to restrict it to urban environment suburbs. So mm -hmm. it so it's 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 an open uh, challenge uh, I would say. Uh, for the first uh, industry to uh, actually have an amazing use case and operationalize it. Uh, I know a lot of entities are doing it, so it's wait and watch where we see who, who's the first one. And, and Dash, if I can just jump on that real quick, one thing I would add is to the gentleman's question about where it's going to happen. I would say yes to all of those. You know, AAM really does expand upon uh, what urban air mobility once was. Could even be inner city, right? City to city. It's going to happen in the United States. So let's make that clear. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's awesome. Great question. Um, and, and to Mr. Lowell, I'll just ask you as, as a, the privilege of the MC, I get one question all day long. So this is going to be my question. To you, uh, when you look at the certification process of what this advanced air mobility uh, capability is, and we realize that, that technology is going to enable us and aircraft and air vehicles to do uh, to operate at a higher level of safety than we ever have before, what does that look like for the for the standard certification process for FAA for pilot for operators drone operators? What does that look like, and how do we how do we get to yes? Because somebody's gonna somebody's gonna answer that question, but but how is that being tackled at this point? Well, you know, great question. I think we talked about that earlier a little bit. Um, so we're trying not to put our current boundaries around certification uh, on that. So vehicles that will be part of this are constructed differently, right? So our focus is always on the safe operation of the vehicle in the national airspace system. What will the vehicle do above populated areas or not? What will the vehicle do for the passengers or the cargo that is in the vehicle? Um, what skills, what medical requirements, all of those things play together into if there is a pilot that, that operates it inside the vehicle, if there's a pilot operating or computer system operating it remotely, those things we don't want to put in the traditional boundaries of what we've always decided a pilot had to be um, or not be, right? So we are, again, trying to evolve with the industry without putting those constraints and blinders on the certification process. So some of it's known. We went through that process that I described earlier with, with this first vehicle, and it ended up um, falling into a, a, a fixed wing aircraft category. Um, but in the future, we envision there will be additional categories that these will be certificated under. Uh, and those are all still under development. And we don't want to predetermine the solution by defining the categories first. We recognize that it's a chicken and egg thing, that you can't really build it if you don't know what the rule's going to be. But we also don't want to limit by putting a rule out there that limits the innovation and the creativity. And we never really truly achieve what we what the industry can achieve with either efficiency or um, type of vehicle or type of propulsion or type of airframe structure, those kind of things. So does that help? Absolutely. Absolutely. hundred percent. If you will just give our, our uh, panel an amazing round of applause for thank you so incredibly much.
because this is this is incredibly exciting for those of you who are online. Uh, this is incredibly exciting. The new environment, the mindset, the mentality, the direction that we're going. So thank you again so much to our panelists. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us. You know, as uh, as we continue forward, next up we're going to be able to have our AFRL Innovare team uh, come up as they're getting ready for that.